people of Peninsula Covenant Church. One of the things that I wanted to bring when I came to be the transition lead pastor is to understand that together is a wonderful place to be. And this morning we are together, and therefore this is a wonderful place to be. My name is Randy Young. I am the transition lead pastor here at Peninsula Covenant Church, and I invite you to uh, join me as we read the scripture for the morning. We are going to look at what it does it mean to be the Church of Jesus Christ and the fact that we are a seeking community. In the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 6, which is a part of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, any one of you, uh, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. I wish I had three hours to go through this text because it takes about three hours. I'm uh, used to uh, teaching three-hour courses or six-hour courses for Fuller Seminary. I'm a little constrained uh, by 30 minutes, but all I get is 30 minutes. So just know that I'm going to be missing a lot of things. You probably will come up and say, you know, you didn't cover this or you didn't cover that, and I will agree I did not cover that. But uh, this sermon is going to be a little bit different. It was, uh, I told people around me uh, that this sermon is a hot mess up to the time of the beginning of worship and probably still is a hot mess, but we'll see where God takes us in, you know, in, in all of this. Question is, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? We are a seeking community. We look for God. We search him out. We don't stay in one place and expect God to come to us because we are not the mountain and God does not come to this mountain, so to speak. 
In a very real way, God and Jesus Christ is the only God who comes to seek us, and that's what Christmas is all about. In no other religion does God come to seek us out. But in our faith, God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be with us, Emmanuel. And at the end of Matthew, in the Great Commission, he says, and lo, I am with you always. God is with us. So what does Jesus mean by saying, seek first the kingdom of God? Well, the question is, what is the kingdom? We have to figure out what the kingdom is so we can begin to understand or figure out where do we look for this? The beginning in uh, in Luke's account of the last words to Jesus, which is in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, he says this. He said, uh, uh, well, actually, one of his disciples said, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? They knew he was the Messiah. But in there, many theologians, including me, think that the disciples thought that Jesus was going to usher the high kingdom of Israel. They're going to go back to when David was the high king of Israel. Aren't you going to come down and push the Romans out of here? They were expecting a political kingdom. They are looking to call down your angels, destroy the Romans, get them out of our land so we can reestablish our kingdom here on earth. Aren't you going to make Peter the secretary of state and John the secretary of defense and James the uh, uh, attorney general? Come on, get with it, God. And God, and Jesus says this, it is not for you to know the times or days the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's important to understand that the kingdom is not a political entity. It is not about politics. Neither is it about a social structure. It is not a place. It is not Walden II. It is not Utopia. By the way, the the book Utopia by Sir Thomas More, a lot of people think this is Utopia. This is a perfect place. This is a wonderful place. This is what God intended for uh, us to live. And what is very little known is that the Greek word that um, Sir Thomas More used uh, was not utopia in terms of the the prefix being eu, which means good, good place, topia. He actually uses the word ou, topia, or not place. He says, basically, it doesn't exist. What I'm writing in here is really kind of a satire. It doesn't exist. So where does the kingdom of God exist? I'd like to suggest to you that in order to find the kingdom of Israel, you have to look to where God reigns. Where is the reign of God? And the reign of God is his people. When we decide to follow Jesus and follow him wherever he leads, no matter what, we give up the leadership of our life to Jesus. And when we do that, we allow his reign to come into our lives. The reign of God is in his people. The reign of God is in every single one of you who has said yes to Jesus And the more we allow God to reign in our lives, the more power and things that will, God will do some amazing things. Three weeks ago, I did a sermon on the Great Commission in which I talked about, I gave six stories of people of as you go wherever you are, 
make disciples. I talked about Kirby Shaw and how his music um, affected generations of high school students across the country, that he was an example as you go wherever you are. I talked about Burl Kane, who was the warden at the state penitentiary in Louisiana, at Angola, and how God used him to transform that prison. He was another example of as you go wherever you are. The third story I told was of Sue Warnke, who was a vice president at Salesforce and developed a, uh, an interest group inside that's become known as Faith Force at Salesforce. And now there are about 3,200 members who pray every week together around the world. The fourth story I told was one of Linda Wilson Allen, how she was a bus driver in the metro San Francisco, that she was another person as, as you go wherever you are. And then I told two more stories. Three weeks ago, I was standing down here after worship, and as I was uh, talking with people, I could see my HR person, Jane Johnson, standing in the back, and she wants to get to me, and she's anxious. And as soon as I was finished with the, the third one, um, she comes running down here, and she goes, do you know who Linda Wilson Allen is? I go, no. Who is she? She's this bus driver. I read about her in many articles. She said, she is LaRon Wilson's mother. LaRon Wilson is our operations coordinator here at Peninsula Covenant Church. I had no idea. I have told the story of Linda Wilson Allen to many churches through that sermon. This morning, Linda Wilson is in the house. And I have invited her to come forward and to take a few minutes to tell her story in her own words. Come on up. We just met right before service. It is one of the thrills of my lifetime that this happened. Never in my wildest imagination that this could be possible. <laughs> Linda, I've told your story. We met for a few minutes out there. You've had an amazing life and what God has done in you and through you. One of the things that the uh, San Francisco Chronicle article mentioned was that you, would, you lived in Walnut Creek at the time. You uh, got up at 2.30 in the morning and spent 30 minutes in prayer because you had a lot to talk about with God. <laughs> Would you tell what kinds of things you talked about with God at 2.30 in the morning, which I'm not quite sure if God's even up at that time because that's just not a part of my theology. But uh, uh, would you, yeah, would you share something about why that was so important to you? Amen. Um, um, not to disrespect you at all, Pastor, but i first like to give honor to God, who is the head of my life. Amen. And I also want to say thank you uh, for this opportunity. Two o'clock in the morning. Amen. But um, I have to go back to raising my six children. And I would pray for them every morning before they got up. And I would pray with them before they left for school. So my prayer time with the Lord is telling him everything. When you send your children off to school, you're just you're sending them out. I needed protection over my children. At the time, we lived in San Francisco, and they would travel to Belmont. They went to Charles Arms School. And so you need that protection. I work for a city in San Francisco as a muni operator. I work part-time. I had to pray God, stretch my budget, you know, my kids still, we still tell a story of we buy seven chicken wings and we only can get one. God stretched my budget. So my prayer time included everything. 
that I needed in my household and for my community. Amen. Amen. There are many really interesting stories that uh, came out um, of how you did your job. You tell that there's a story of uh, a woman named Ivy who was at the time 80 years old and you would help with the grocery bags to get on and off the bus and walking across the street. And you talked, uh, the story talked about Tanya, who you ran into as a, when she was a student at San Francisco State University, looking a little bit lost and, and homesick. And you said to her, hey, Thanksgiving's coming up. Why don't you come over on Thursday and kick it with me and the kids? I, I love that term, kick it with me. <laughs> and then uh, there was the story of Sam. Sam, who you would, you know, people who like to do things at the last microsecond. He would come down out of his apartment, down to the bus stop, which was right in front of the apartment, and you would slow down and you would give two long honks to let him know that you were coming so he wouldn't miss the bus. So many other stories. So many other stories. And I have to ask, what compelled you to do all those things? Amen. First of all, I get very emotional because my memory goes back to those days. But when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, we become a servant for God. We are his servant. My job might not be your job, but you are chose to do something for God. And whatever I, whatever I do, I give it back to him, even today. Lord, I don't know what you want me to say, but I'm your servant today. And so I became a servant to serve the city of San Francisco, to serve in my community, to serve in my church, wherever it may be. So um, Ivy, Miss Ivy, was a, she was a nurse, and uh, I believe I was doing the five line at that time of 31 Bebel. I drove all the lines. <laughs> but nevertheless, Miss Ivy would come and get on my bus. And so, you know, you're operating, you're driving here, but here you have your senior seats. And I would say, anybody sit over in that seat, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it started with Miss Ivy. And then she um, began to tell all the drivers on the line. Where is Linda? Where is Miss Linda? I want to ride her bus. She's the best bus driver. Fast forward, Miss Ivy, as she aged, she went into a, a, a facility, and I'm still connected with her. I'll go see her. I'll take her grocery shopping. And in the end, Miss Ivy had me to be the beneficiary of her estate. I have Miss Ivy in my home today. She's, she's in my home today. Um, Tanya, <laughs> I just spoke with Tanya last week. <laughs> um, she's my sister. When we met, I, I, she was lost that night coming from the library at City College, I believe. Um, she was lost. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. I was driving an owl at the time. And as the story says, she, she didn't know which way to go. And I'm like, come on. I'm going to get you where you need to go. But in that conversation, she sat over there in my office. <laughs> that conversation began. And to this day, her and I are best of sisters. And the last was Sam. Oh, my God. <laughs> we have to tell Sam. So Sam was my passenger. I don't know how long Sam had been riding my bus. And he'd get on and... There was those days he was on time. There was those days he was running. But I, I just picked up the little habit. When I come down the little hill, I would toot and toot. <laughs> and then I would wait 30 seconds because I'm on a time. I'm driving from uni. There was days he would wave out the window like, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there was days he's, I can see him coming down. So um, Sam came to me one day, and uh, he said, can I do a story on you? I'm like, story on me? I'm just an operator, you know, little me. 
Come to find out, Sam worked for Quran, the Quran, San Francisco Chronicles. And so this is where we are today. If I can uh, add one little thing to this here uh, story that I don't think was in the paper. We don't know what God is going to do with our lives. I was a single, well, I take that back. I was a mom who raised six children. Who would say I would be speaking in front of you today to share my story? Who would say I would tell you that God wants us to be a servant and love him, meet him first thing in the morning for you, go out into the world before you leave, before you send your children out? God is so good to us. God is so good. So I just want to leave you with that. God bless you. Thank you so much. <laughs> bless you, people. Thank you, Linda. Good Lord, where do I go from here? Get on muni. <laughs> Where's the kingdom of God? It's where God reigns. And it's reigned in Linda's life and continues to reign. And the same is true for each and every one of you. Not only did she do good things, but she built relationships. Deep ones, lasting ones. And that's part of God give, God's gift to us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness. That's just as important as seeking the kingdom. What in the world does that mean? What is righteousness? It's not a word that we typically use in normal conversations when we talk about the warriors or the uh, terrible situations the Giants are in or the upcoming season of the 49ers or what's happening in politics. We don't talk about righteousness. And yet, there is a lot of righteousness going on in our country in terms of the attitude, how we talk to one, one another. And, it's, and, and you can see it through places like Facebook and Twitter and the whole cancel culture. The Pharisees were good at righteousness. Well, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And why are you not reading your Bible? And why are you not coming to Torah study? And why are you not giving at 10%? And why, are you, and, and, and why don't you pray like us? And they try to shame people into becoming better. That same kind of attitude happens today. We could see it through covid Mask up, no mask. Vaccine up, no vaccine. Social distancing, no social distancing. Take them down off of Twitter so their voice can't be heard. All that is the sense of righteousness that I know better. I know better than you. You should do what I tell you to do. There's all kinds of righteousness going on but notice what Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We are pursuing God's righteousness, God's sense of right and wrong. Righteousness has everything to do with right and wrong. Jesus said in uh, John uh, 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If there's truth, if there is truth, then there are lies. If there is right, there is wrong. If there is good, there is bad. If there is God, then there is Satan. If I did five minutes on each one of those, we're going to go about 15 minutes long. Can't do it. I'm going to just take a couple of them. I'm just going to take the last one. If there is God, then there is Satan. 
There's a very famous quote. I don't know if everyone thinks it's a famous quote, but a quote from the movie Usual Suspects. You know, that great theological film back in the 20 years ago with Kevin Spacey. The Kevin Spacey um, character says very quietly, but distinctly, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he did not exist. If we don't think that Satan exists, we ignore him. We don't recognize him. We just live our lives. And yet he will pull us into his orbit uh, in many of the ways that's outlined by C.S. Lewis in his book, uh, The Screwtape Letters. When I talk with people, the whole thing of Satan and evil is hardly a part of the theological equation. And if we can't recognize evil, we cannot fight it. I've been known to say that Satan's much more powerful than us. We cannot do battle with him face to face. We cannot arm wrestle with, with Satan because he's more powerful. And yet, God says in James 4, 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God has given us the power to resist Satan and evil. We have that power, but we don't use it if we don't recognize when Satan is plaguing us and striking us and trying to lead, him down, lead us down the wrong path. Jesus said to his disciples when they asked, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? They think it's a political kingdom. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Really what he is saying is, it's not about politics. It's not about social, um, making things right socially. It's spiritual in nature. In Ephesians chapter six, he's, Paul says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. As a seeking community, we seek the kingdom, we seek the king, we seek his reign, and we seek his righteousness. Later on, Paul says this, beginning in verse 13. He says again, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Remember, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. The only offensive weapon mentioned in that whole thing is the sword. I would bet good money. When you read this text, put on the sword of the, of the spirit, which is the word of God, that a lot of people will think of a medieval sword, kind of a, maybe a saber, you know, about this long. Maybe the first image in your mind is a Roman sword, which is a wide blade, double-sided, about this long. 
Some of you might even think this is a William Wallace broadsword that you have to take two hands and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let's get the word of God and let's just take it and just let's just slay people. Interestingly, there are like seven or eight different words in Greek for the word sword. And the one that Paul uses in this case is one called machiron. And a machiron is not a Roman sword. It is not an English broadsword. It is a small sword, actually more like a dagger. It is often translated as scalpel. It is for fine work. Everything else in that text is about being defensive in nature. We use the word of the Lord to be defensive and to be very careful that we don't cut nerves. Can we cut the right thing? Friends, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first his righteousness. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And in the end, you will be able to stand firm and resist the devil. O Lord our God, thank you for this opportunity to proclaim the word to help people understand what it is you want from us for our lives. Give us the motivation to seek first your kingdom each and every day. Stir us to seek your righteousness, to know what is right and what is wrong. Help us to realize that our battle is not of this world, but of the spiritual realm. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And the people of God said,